Hello, and welcome to the next episode of the Live Your Spa Life Show. Spa life is a lifestyle that accepts that accomplishment and harmony coexist. The spa and spa life, the SPA, is for seek power always, that power within you to do your greater work in the world. I am so honored for our next guest is Dr. John Demartini, who is a world-renowned specialist in human behavior, a researcher, author, global educator. He was recently selected as top human behavior specialist of the year for 2020, someone who actually accomplished something in 2020, by the initial, the International Association of Top Professionals. Dr. Demartini has studied over 30,000 books, I'm coming back to this, 30,000 books from across the defined academic disciplines and has synthesized the wisdom of the ages, which he shares on stage in over 100 countries. Dr. Demartini is the author of over 40 self-development books, including the best-selling The Breakthrough Experience and his new global release, The Values Factor. He has been featured in film documentaries such as The Secret, The Opus, and Oh My God, alongside Ringo Starr, Seal, and Hugh Jackman. He has shared the stage with some of the world's most influential speakers, such as Stephen Covey, Sir Richard Branson, Wayne Dyer, Deepak Chopra, and Donald Trump, as well as being interviewed on world's leading television and radio networks, such as Larry King Live, The Early Show, and Wall Street, as well as magazine publications, stay with me here, such as Shape, Leadership, Success, Prestige, Entrepreneur, and O. Dr. John Demartini, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> this is so great. And the reason why I wanted to go back to this you know, study of 30,000 books, it's just there's this synthesis that you've done of wisdom. And I would like to know, like, in, when you look back at all the research that you've done, and, and research is part of, of your passion and your values, what is one facet of wisdom that has impacted you the most over the years? Um, well, it's really basic, actually. How important it is to really clearly define what is deeply most meaningful, most inspiring, most authentic, that you spontaneously want to pursue, that allows you to make a difference that contributes vastly to people, and pursue that incrementally to build momentum to achieve amazing greatness. That to me is the key that all of us have the capacity to do something extraordinary with. Yes, I, I love that. And that part of just leading with like what is most important with you, you talk about uh, a lot about values and you talk about values and this really shifted for me because I went through the, the breakthrough experience with you and this was actually a life-changing shift for myself of when you talked about values of what life demonstrates versus what you hope for, right? About what it actually looks like in terms of knowing thyself. And I had did like several like uh, values type testing and different type of things. But when I went through your program and one of the things I looked at was what am I doing on a daily day basis? What is actually calling me forward? What is it that I love to do? And that was really a shift in that for me. And it seems basic when you say it out loud, but it's one thing to say it. And then it's another thing to live it as far as what your life actually demonstrates. And so that was, that was a big difference for me. And I think for people, particularly in, over this last year, uh, I think sometimes they let a lot of external circumstances kind of take them out in terms of how they were doing their life. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about like the the seven areas of life. And for, for those who aren't familiar with that, I'm just gonna say what they are so that our audience is on the same page as we are. But the seven areas of life are spiritual, mental, vocational, financial, familiar, uh, social, and physical. And so what do you think as far as in 2020, what do you think what area of life tripped people up the most? Well, that depends on them because the values, the set of values that people have that are unique to them, they're like fingerprints, um, could have a different construction than the person next to them. Each set of values that we hold are like fingerprints and they're unique. They're, they're, they're not the same. So some people are very, very dedicated to intellectual pursuits, academics. Some people are very dedicated to business pursuit, entrepreneurs. Some people dedicated to wealth building, financiers, 
Some people are very dedicated to family pursuits. Mothers or fathers, family leaders. Some are social pursuits, public politicians or social causes. Some physical pursuits, maybe yoga instructors or fitness or fitnesses or maybe models. And some spiritual pursuits, maybe religious uh, leaders or possibly gurus or something of this nature. None of them are right or wrong. The whole world requires all the spectrum of values to work. Everybody's got something that they're going to need and delegate and somebody else is going to do it, etc. I don't, I'm mainly an intellectual and I, 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 I study and I research and I teach. But some people are phys physical fitness buffs. So there are no right ones, no wrong ones. Everybody's needed. And mastering the skill of identifying your own and knowing what's really a hierarchy of your own values, which is determining how you perceive, decide, and act in life, and your behavior and your outcome and your own destiny. And then mastering the skill of communicating what that is that's really inspiring to you and important to you in terms of what's inspiring to others and seeing how what they're doing serves you. So you don't have to fix them or change them, but honor them and communicate effectively with them by helping them get what they want so you get what you want. This is a, a wise pursuit that I think um, we need to honor because we sometimes self-righteously project our values onto others and expect others to live in our values or self-righteously minimize ourselves and inject their values into us and try to live by their values, both of which are futile. Mm -hmm. We're not here to put people on pedestals or pits. We're here to put them in our hearts and to communicate effectively, honorably, respectfully in their values and our own values. And I think that's the key to mastering life along this journey. Yeah, I love that. You know, one of the things you talk about is that we're all of it. Like we're not all good or we aren't all bad. We have to like enjoy like the whole spectrum of things. And, you know, uh, I actually had a, a guest uh, which made me think of you and I was laughing. Her book is called that uh, everything I know I learned from my pimp. And what I loved about that was that, you know, people will sometimes make wrong the experiences or things that, that she did or what she had, or to think that she could actually have a learning experience from her pimp, there could be judgment or shame or things that are around that. Uh, but one of the things you talk about is that no one escapes what's needed for growth, right? And some of the things that we think are mistakes actually aren't. And so I was smiling when I was uh, talking to her because I was thinking about you know, some of the things that you've said around this is that, you know, just because it's not our experience doesn't mean that that isn't what we need to have. And so I love that when people actually embrace all aspects of who they are and to be able to go in and see how they can shift that or what was the lesson for them in that. And that's part of the whole breakthrough experience is, is looking at our, our perceptions. Um, what would you tell people that, um, you know, they're maybe stuck into their own story of, of judging it in a way of being good or bad and to have them be able to look at, at their perceptions? We only perceive ourselves making mistakes when we compare our actions to somebody else's value system. Because we made that decision based on our own values. It wasn't a mistake in our assessment. Our brain is automatically doing these assessments. And we only perceive other people making a mistake when we are expecting them to live in our value system. And they can't. Nobody can sustain living in somebody else's value system except during moments of infatuation, the first few weeks in a new relationship, maybe. And that will eventually wear down. Right. So we're not here to do that. And, and I, I had many, many years ago, over 30-something years ago, I did a very fun exercise. I went through the Oxford Dictionary which is the largest dictionary I could find in it, the smallest little print. And I went through page by page neurotically and circled every known human behavioral trait that a human being could have. Because I was noticing that I was emotionally reacting to people around me and then discovering that the thing I was judging in them was me, something I had done. So instead of uh, waiting for people to initiate those reactions, I thought, why don't I preempt it? by going to the dictionary and finding out what are the things that I might react to and judge. So I went through and I identified 4,628 individual traits in the dictionary that a human being can display. Nice, mean, kind, cruel, honest, dishonest, pleasant, unpleasant, considerate, inconsiderate, you know, uh, loyal, dishonor, disloyal, whatever it is. 
all these pairs of opposites. And then I went through and I thought of the most extreme example of an individual who displays that trait, that behavior. And I put their initial out to the side. So my book is filled with all these initials and underlines. And then I went into my life and I looked at where and when did I perceive myself displaying or demonstrating that behavior, the same or similar as what I see in that, in this, on this page and in these people, to the degree that I see it in these individuals that are the most extreme examples I could think of. And I dug and had to dig past my unconscious barriers and walls I was putting up and, and, and personas that I wanted to protect and to look carefully, and I found out that I had all 4,628 traits. There was nothing missing me. I was a hero and a villain and a saint and a sinner and a virtue and a vice. I was kind and cruel and open and closed and honest and dishonest. And when I finally realized that every one of those traits were part of my life, I then asked, have I gotten rid of any of them? That was a real wake-up call. I realized that I still surfaced the very things I've been trying to get rid of, I still surface periodically. And then I realized, you know what? How are you going to love yourself if you're trying to get rid of half of yourself? How are you going to love the people around you if you're trying to get rid of half of them? And I realized that I had a set of values. And when my values were supported, I was a nice pussycat. And when my values were challenged, I was a tiger. I was nice, mean, kind, cruel, generous, stingy, open, closed. Uh, verbose, secretive. And I realized that my values are filtering my reality. And I'm displaying these pairs of opposite behaviors that we can have, these bipolar expressions. And I had them all. And then I realized that the only reaction I'm having to other people, the only time I'm wanting to fix them is when it's reminding me of something I'm not owning in myself and judging. And I, I have compassion for those things that remind me of my wounds. And I have arrogance when I think that I don't have it. I'm too proud to admit it. So whether I'm humble or too proud to admit what I see in others inside me is the things that are running my life and distracting me by things I infatuate and resent. And I realized by owning all the traits, it allowed me to have a lot more adaptability and appreciation for people around me and realize that I don't need to fix them. They have them too. And then I realized that all the traits were needed for me to fulfill my mission. There was times when I needed every one of those behaviors. So I think in the older statement that was a biblical statement under Ecclesiastes, there's a time for everything under the sun, a time for peace, a time for war, a time for kind and cruel and, and everything that you could imagine. So I'm trying to teach people how to love all themselves, not try to get rid of half of themselves. Wow, what a big difference that made in my life. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I really learned to appreciate that as well, because when you have something that's, you know, triggering you, and then to look and, and discover like where that may have showed up in your life, it's such an eye opening thing where you can actually then have empathy, you can actually see where someone came from, or why you would do certain things. Uh, and, you know, I remember when I worked undercover, particularly prostitution, you know, there were a lot of things in that that were not part of how I grew up or was the right thing to do or or the language. And I can remember my dad saying things like, you know, like, why are you talking like that? That wasn't the mouth I paid for for college. And, you know, but there was things I learned in taking on those personas that actually became part of, of the my vast fabric of how I could relate to things, how I could see things, how I could look at things from a perspective that I would have never been able to see before if I wasn't in in that place. So I so appreciate the fact of just being able to look at even in the most challenging of situations to be able to see like, how did something happen for me? What was the good thing that came out of that? And I think that's a little bit of the mind twister that happens with, with your work, because I think some people will say, well, you know, how can something good come out of, you know, a rape or a murder or something like we think of like the most horrible things. However, that is part of the path, right? That's part of the experience. That's part of what we're doing to fulfill the things that we need to do. And I think that that's sometimes a, a challenging blip for some people to look at that because there's a part I think of society where it's like, well, I don't want to be that right because of the judgment that may come out of, of that aspect. Uh, so for, for people that are maybe not as familiar with this work, what do you think would be a good first step for them to even uh, open up to the possibility that they're all of it? 
Well, I, uh, I have, you know, in, in the Breakthrough Experience program, which I've done 1,115 times, I, um, I ask people to identify somebody they admire most and despise most, infatuate with most, and resent most, attract to, repel, that they have an impulse towards and an instinct away. And then I identify what that trait is that they admire or despise most. And then I ask them to go inside and look at where and when they displayed it. And they, they don't want to. They're too, either too humble or too proud to want to admit it. But I hold them accountable and make them look again. I don't want them to make anything up. I just want them to make themselves look beyond their facade, the persona, the mask that they cover themselves up with and look. And I've been doing this now 36 years almost. And I assure people that the other, whatever you see in others is inside you. And that is such an eye opener when people get to do that. Can I share a little story? I don't know if it's- if, Please, if, yeah, absolutely. So I was, uh, over a year ago, I was asked to mediate a conflict um, between uh, five Palestinian leaders and um, three Israeli leaders. Uh, pardon me, five Israeli leaders and three Palestinian leaders in a hotel room, a special room, kind of a secure room uh, for this meeting. Mm -hmm. And right when I started off, it's very tense. I mean, if you had a knife in the room, and <laughs> air, it would just sit in the air, kind of a real dense energy. Yeah. A lot of judgment was sitting in that energy because these are people that are enemies. They're real fighters. And um, this lady spoke up and said, Dr. Martini, do you believe in absolute evil? And I said, no. She says, well, I do. I said, do you think it may be the reason why you've had 14 years of trying to negotiate a peace settlement and haven't gotten anywhere? <laughs> she didn't know what to say on that one. And I said, so let's just take that assumption of absolute evil, because that's a moral absolute, which is a sign of amygdala response, not executive function in the brain. It's a subjective bias taken to the hilt, infinity over one, all bad, uh, one over infinity, all good kind of thing. You know, these are, these are distortions. And I said, uh, so identify, go, go to the individual that you think has absolute evil. She, he goes, I, I got him. I said, and does the guy across the table? I said, great. Now, what specific trait, action, inaction, do you perceive this individual displaying or demonstrating that you have labeled and despise most as absolute evil. She says, intolerance. Now, you're, you're, it's hard not to chuckle because you can see that she's being intolerant at the moment. She, <laughs> she's too proud to admit she's doing the very thing she's judging. Right? So, Did you have um, a mirror with you? Or? <laughs> I'd like to hold up the mirror. Now, I said, okay, then I'm gonna ask you some really confronting questions. Go to a moment where and when you perceive yourself displaying or demonstrating that same or similar specific trait action in action called intolerance. Go to a moment you've done that. She says, I can't, I don't do that. I pride myself on never being that way. See, always and nevers are absolutes. So right. She's blind, she's blind to her own reality. I said, well, I certainly do. And I started down listing. This is the benefit of doing that excellent. I downlisted all of my intolerances. And I thought of, I went around the wheel of life, the seven areas of life, and I looked at all my intolerances in almost every one of those areas, at airports, hotels, girlfriends, kids. I, I went around all areas, financial issues, business issues. And she says, okay. And then she started to look at where she has moments of intolerance, including intolerance of the behavior of these individuals right there that was so obvious. I got 32 examples out of her over the next two hours almost. Wow. 32 examples of where she's in tolerance until a tear came out of her eye. And she was really humbled. And she goes, I said, are you now certain that what you perceive in this individual, you display and demonstrate in your own life now? Can you see you do it quantitatively equal to his? Yes. Great. Now go to a moment where and when you perceive this individual displaying or demonstrating this specific trait action in action that you despise most, which is intolerance. Go to a moment when you actually perceive him doing it. Not hearsay, 
but an actual perception that's happening. So it's not just assumptions. Yes. Okay. At that moment, from that moment till now, how did that serve you? How is it a benefit to you? What was the upside? What were the benefits, the, the positives of that? Well, there isn't any. I, 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 how did it serve you? How did it benefit you? I can't see any. That means you didn't look because you gave me an answer before you even took the time to look. Look again. I don't know. Stop. You're a professional writer. You've written a book on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. You're a leader of millions of people. You have massive influence. If it wasn't for that individual that you've written about and made your life revolve around, where would you be? Who would you be? That never happened. Does he actually give you some sort of meaning by his doing it, your drive and your identity? Take away him and anybody like him, would you even have an identity or leadership role? No. So what's the benefit of this individual playing a role in your life? Did it make you study? Did it make you learn? Did it make you learn how to manage and lead? And everything? Okay. And we started rolling. I did 39 benefits wow. until a tear came out of her eye. And I said, now, are you certain that there's absolute evil there? Or was there a hidden benefits and advantages and, quote, good sitting inside that that you were unconscious of? She goes, definitely. I said, right now, are the benefits equaling the drawbacks? And she goes, yes. Can you see you wouldn't even be where you are, who you are, if it hadn't have been for that experience? Yes. Now, I have a question for you. You say you're a leader and you're striving for peace. But are you sure that you're a leader leading people to peace? Or are you following the angry crowd and being just a, an influencer for your own identity around the crowd? Because it doesn't sound like you're leading them. It sounds like you're giving them what they want, following their needs like a pollster. Are you truly leading them to an, a, a resolution like we're doing right now in this room? She stopped and she was humbled and she goes, kind of checkmate there. I said, because if you're really committed to doing it, you would identify within yourself what you see in this individual and you come to a common ground and begin a communication process. Because if you're too proud to admit what you see in another individual, to admit that in your life, you have no grounds to communicate with. You're looking down on them and projecting your values and wanting to negotiate in your favor narcissistically instead of actually with equanimity. When we finished, she was in tears. And we took a break. It was about a three hour plus. Their bladders were filled. And when she went off to the bathroom to clear up her makeup, the gentleman that she was started attacking initially came up to me. I said, you know, Dr. DiMartini, that was amazingly insightful what you just did. I, I was following along and doing the same thing back, thinking the same thing. I could have sworn you were talking about me. I said, we were. Because really? I said, yes. I had the exact same feeling about this lady. And right now, I've been diffused. That, I, just by that one little exercise already, we're already feeling a diffused of that. I said, listen. We go around in a survival mentality, sometimes with highly subjective biases, become blinded by our subjectivity, and don't look at the objective facts about human beings, that human beings want to fulfill their lives. And just because they have different sets of values doesn't mean that they're not honorable. It just means that we have not seen how their values are helping us fulfill ours. And our job is not to be exclusive, but to be inclusive for the cultural development as a leader. He said, so what she did and what you did, being humble and put on the spot like that, I think was helpful for this entire room. So thank you for being here and having the courage to actually have this, this dialogue. Mm -hmm. I then went on three or four months. I came back to South Africa and I got asked to go on a radio show, an Israeli radio show. And this lady told her entire story and was absolutely humble on the show and admitted that she was thinking she was a leader, but actually wounded by her past and was projecting her anger of her wound onto somebody else and was taking advantage of them to become known and take advantage of that. 
And she says, I've made a decision that I want to be a real leader. I want to lead a resolution. And if I lose some of my followers in the pursuit of that, then I respect that because I'm here to actually make a resolution. Mm -hmm. So she actually had a transformation for three hours of asking a new set of questions because the quality of her life is based on the quality of the questions we asked by owning traits that she didn't want to own in herself to transcend the moral hypocrisies that people get trapped in about the idealisms that we are supposed to live by instead of honoring the magnificence of our wholeness, which is all the above. Right. I love that. I love that story. And, you know, it really has us look at, you know, how are we operating? You know, how are we projecting and, and what are we taking, you know, responsibility for and what we look at? And I know one of the things that, uh, you know, in our household, you know, we used to hear things like, well, you always do this, or, you know, I never do that, or, you know, these absolutes that you talk about. And it's so important. We kind of have this funny language in our family where we're like, well, you know, sometimes I am a jerk, or sometimes I do do this, or what, and so it kind of diffuses the all or never, where you're having this allowance for like, we're all of it. And when you're actually able to see that, uh, that perception of how, how things look through somebody else's eyes and their experience, I mean, we can never know fully, because we're not we haven't been there in the moment, right? And there's so many things that people will will say where they haven't even actually experienced it full firsthand, right? It's, it's a lot of times it's secondhand information. So then, you know, it's like three or four people removed and then they actually don't even know that person. They don't even know how they react to these things. So it's so important to look at like, what are we actually seeing? How are we reacting? And, you know, when we're setting forth how we think about things, it's like, what are we taking that from? Is it from our view and our values only, which, you know, of course that has us win, right? But that doesn't help in furthering communication to be able to see the other side for, for people. So I, I love how you bring this uh, in, into light. And uh, I know sometimes it can be really tedious to dive deep into those things, right? Because at first we want to be like, no, I'm not that, right? And, and then when you really start looking into it and you can really see that we've had all of these different experiences. It is a very humbling experience, but that is how we can actually make shifts and change and to really uplift people and, and meet them where they're at and who they are versus who we want them to be. Exactly. So, you know, particularly like in, in families, um, you know, over this last year, you know, people were spent probably more time with, with their family than, than they ever anticipated. Right. And, you know, instances of, of you know domestic violence and child abuse and suicide i mean people were so in their stuff that there were a lot of triggers and things happening how is it that you know people can kind of see outside of themselves and have more of this perspective when things outside seem crazy well it's never the outside it's your perception of the outside right we have control of our perceptions decisions and actions William James, the father of modern psychology, said that the greatest discovery of his generation is that human beings can alter their lives by altering their perceptions or attitudes of mind. So the first thing is to not assume that the outside is the source. Because as Epictetus said, a Stoic said, first in our journey of personal development, we blame others. But then eventually we blame ourselves. And then we finally realize there was nothing to blame. Hmm. It's that we had gotten trapped, subordinating to a disempowering moral imperative about how it's supposed to be that's hypocritical that's unavailable and non-livable that we've imposed on ourselves and other people and then punished ourselves or others because they don't match the fantasy that we've got addicted to about how life is supposed to be the magnificence of how a life really is is greater than all the fantasies that we get trapped in the fastest way to disempower a culture is to promote an idealism that nobody can live by and this is something common. We subordinate like sheep and conform, as Ernest Becker said in his Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Denial of Death. We conform to the herd and never even question the thought behind it. And we don't even realize that the very thing that we're being taught as direct, the Nobel Prize winner said, it's not that we don't know so much, it's that we know so much that isn't so. And we never question it. Mm -hmm. And we're going, you know, I, I, I thought that you know, being one-sided was perfect. And that, well, nobody's perfect. Nobody, we, you know, I can't get perfect with it because I was trying to be a one-sided thing. But a magnet has two sides. A human being has two sides. Our physiology has anabolism and catabolism. 
to make up metabolism. It has build and destroy, oxidation and reduction, mitosis, apoptosis. There's pairs of opposites inside our physiology, inside ecology, inside sociology. In every discipline, 299 disciplines that I've studied, researched, and written about, I've yet to see any discipline that doesn't have that pair of opposites. But somehow in psychology, sociology, theology, and physiology, human beings are frightened to get grounded to see both sides and honor both sides. Life is good, death is bad. But your body's got life and death every single second. It's got plasticity. Uh, it's, it's got uh, you know neuro, neuroplasticity going on, bone plasticity. Everything's building and destroying. So I'm a firm believer in finally honoring both sides because you need both build and destroy in your physiology to adapt to a changing environment. You need it in society to adapt to a changing astronomical environment. So we, we can, we're capable of handling the truth. <laughs> but, but, but our amygdala, our, our subcortical amygdala, the little desire center, the, the one that wants the sugar and wants the consumption and wants the, the addictive behaviors, the one that makes you buy things, the economic driver of society is wanting a quick fix of one side, immediate gratification of one side. And therefore, society sells that to people. Religion sell it. Politics sell it. I'm not interested in those facades that are un unlivable. I'm interested in what's true, what's objective, to build a foundation of living your life by. And I believe people are mature enough that they're capable of doing it. They just haven't been surrounded by the opportunity to learn about it. Right. We're so I used agree. to being economic uh, idealisms that because it sells. It sells. The fantasy sells. Right, right. Oh, it's so important to just to ask those deeper questions. And I think that that's what has actually kept people more in fear is that they know something's off. Like, it's like, you know, the truth that's there. But when you don't ask the question, sometimes I think it's because you're afraid of the answer. Because if you then step into that truth, you then have to live differently, you have to be differently, and you have to break down those facades of what has shown up for you. Exactly. So I think that's where the fear comes in when people are expressing fear, it's because it's that fear of change. It's fear of like, you know, it's like people staying in, in relationships that are, you know, abusive relationships. It's like, well, what are they getting out of that? You know, what, what shifts or change would, would need to happen? There's something, some benefit that that's happening in that, whether or not that's, you know, they consciously make those shifts or changes, but to have people kind of create that safe environment and having the language and the tools, right? To be able to talk through these things to get yourself to the other side and the truth's the truth, right? Yeah, but what's interesting is that people think they want a safe environment. That's the illusion. Mm. The addiction to safety draws in tragedy. <laughs> yes, yes. I always say the more you're looking for protection, the more you attract aggression. The more you're looking for one side, the more the other smacks you. See, our executive center in the prefrontal cortex is the objective center. It wants uh, objective reason. It wants subjective truth. Mm -hmm. And our amygdala wants to avoid pain, seek pleasure, avoid predators, seek pain, pain you know, prey. It, it wants a polarization. And so it wants a one-sided world. The, the one at the top, the executive center, embraces both sides of the world. It mitigates risks. It handles rewards. It does both of them. Our, when we're mature, we, are, we have the myelinated forebrain where we use that executive center. We set real objectives, but we're not mature yet. We let our amygdala run us. We want a quick fix. And so people are there to sell it to us. Politicians are there to sell us. Religions are there to sell us. Businesses are there to sell it to us. So if you're living in that subcortical amygdala desire center, you're going to want to avoid a pain and seek a pleasure. And you will confuse a goal with a fantasy instead of a goal with an objective. Right. And, and mature, wise individuals understand that no matter what you pursue, you're going to have a pair of opposites. Mm -hmm. And so when you're search, searching for a relationship, imagine I'm in a relationship. I only want nice, never mean, only kind, never cruel, only positive, never negative, always peace, never war, always give, never take. It's not going to happen. You're going to, you're going to be pursuing something. You're going to be angry and you're going to be bitter and you're going to be punishing the person because they're not la living up to your fantasy. But when you finally realize that the individual you're with has both sides, and so do your goals, and so does everything in life, you now start to set real objectives and embrace life objectively and are not run by your amygdala. And now, instead of having unrealistic expectations that can be never met and constantly feeling distressed by attracting the things that you're trying to avoid, 
You're now pursuing inspired challenges that wake up your genius, that allow you to solve problems, that make a contribution, make a difference, and leave a legacy in the planet. Mm -hmm. And we have all that capacity to do that. If you're not filling your day with challenges that inspire you, your day is going to fill up with challenges that don't. If you don't fill your day with high priority actions that really inspire you, your day is designed to fill up with low priority distractions that don't. Because it's only when you're pursuing what's really deeply meaningful that you live authentically. And then you're, you're, the universe around you is trying to get you authentic. It's, it's so important. You know, one of the things it, it reminded me that you had said is that unless you have an astronomical vision, you can't have impact. Like you have to have this, you know, it, it's all the, all of it, the whole spectrum of it. Because if you do look at one of it, you're missing the lessons of the other parts of it. You're missing, you know, the information that, that comes out of it, the experience that comes out of that. And, you know, we, we all create that based on, on our values and what those look like. Uh, you know, which reminds me, one of the things I always love to ask uh, my guests, because we do create our, our environment. I know you travel quite a bit, but you're, you're home more these days than not, is that we have different experiences in our home as far as how we, we feel in our, our bedrooms versus our kitchens, our offices. So what is your favorite room in your home and why? Well, you're going to probably laugh at this, but my home is a ship. I don't know if you know that. I live yes, on a ship. Actually, I do. <laughs> yeah. And, and the ship is in Tenerife, the Canary Islands right now, temporarily ported there because of Corona. So I've been for 10 months living in a hotel, in a fabulous oh, wow. hotel. They've been, they've been taking care of me like royalty. It's actually a royal semester. And um, I don't have a home. I've sold, I had 11 homes at one time. My wife, when she was alive, she loved homes. I, 11 homes. I've sold all the homes. I, I live on my ship or I'm staying in hotels or flying. And um, I, I don't have that favorite room because I don't have that. I don't live in any one place. Well, what's your favorite part on the ship? Uh, well, when I'm when I'm on the ship, I love the library, as you can imagine, because I can just sit and just it's quiet. I just love sitting in the library. It's like this picture. It's that kind of thing. Yeah, I love that. I I also uh, love the little what they call Freddy's little deli. It's a sidewalk cafe on the ship, where everybody goes by and you say hi to people and you have something to eat there. That's those are two places that I spend most frequently. If I'm not in my room at my desk with a book. I'm in the library with a book, or sometimes I'm with a book down in the Freddy's uh, Deli and getting something to nibble on. But I, I, I'm a firm believer that, you know, you got to give yourself permission to get outside the box of how people think it should be. Mm -hmm. It's hard to comprehend it because people go, well, how can you live in a hotel? I said, very simple. I, um, I'm, I delegate everything except research, write, and teach. I don't drive. I don't cook. I don't clean. I don't do domestic duty. I don't do anything but research, write, and teach. Those are the three highest priorities that I love doing most. Everything else has been delegated. I've delegated everything. I've been. People have joked with me and said, "So you probably delegated things to your to to other people for, on behalf of your partner, your 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 girlfriend." I said, "Oh yeah." I go up to my girlfriend and I say, "Look, if I could get you Hugh Jackman or Brad Pitt to take care of the love making." On my behalf, would you still love me? And she'll go, I love you even more. <laughs> I delegate everything. That was a joke. I delegate everything because if you're not doing the highest priority things that's highest on your values throughout your day, you're devaluing yourself. You're diluting your potential energy. And you're ending up feeling like you're living in imperatives instead of indicatives and being inspired. And once I learned that, I, I hired people around me that were specialists that love doing what I want to delegate and give the job opportunities and employment to people that would love to do what they love doing, freeing me up to do what I love doing. And to me, that, that, to, there's nothing stopping us from doing it. I train people, thousands of people on how to do that and how to live their life the way they want. And they may not be the way I do it. They may want to go and exercise. Look at Warren Buffett. He spends most of the day leading, reading financial statements all day. He loves that. He doesn't do anything else but that most of the time or interviews. Right. Giving yourself permission to structure your life in an inspiring way, the way you would love it to be, is totally doable. And I love doing that. And so I do what I do. And I, and, and I live a, I say that I live a, the universe is my playground. The world is my home. Every country is a room in the house and every city is a platform to share my heart and soul. I don't have a one spot that's the rooted space. 
the ship goes all over the world. So I, every country, as far as I'm concerned, is home. And, and, and the rooms really don't make much difference to me because it's, it's my mindset. It's my, my associations that I make in my mind right here. And I realize that there's a malleability to that and that I can take any part of whatever environment I am in and find out how it's serving me and fulfilling my mission right now. And I could turn it into opportunity. I love that. Well, and I've taken that to heart, you know, from when we connected over the summer, because I really looked at, you know, my values and my top two were, you know, being with my people. So the people I love and uh, having epic health. And along those two lines is I started having these uh, extended family weekends where my people would come and stay for like an extended weekend. And I got to be with them and we got to be together and we did our own thing. And it was just so great because that was a high value of mine. That's what I wanted to do. And so I had opened up my home to that. And then along the lines of the Epic Health is I entered a couple of uh, fitness contests in, at my gym and I lost 8% body fat and gained muscle mass as part of it because that was such a big value that I dedicated some time to that and was like, that was all my focus. And that's what fueled me, which ironically, you know, there's also a part of me that wants to help, you know, uh, in saving and rescuing the children. That was like the third thing. And I get part of that in, you know, interviewing people and being able to connect with how they're being a force for good. And, and all those things started weaving together. And I was getting the energy from that. And there was a part of me that was like, well, what business part do I do? Or how's that fit in? Or the marketing thing? And I'm like, I hate that part, right? And I was just doing the things that I love to do. And people were calling and saying, I need you to be my consultant. I need you to be my coach. I need to... And it was like, I was just doing me, right? And the parts I was doing. And I just want to thank you for that just reevaluation about what was important to me and what I was focusing on. And just that bigger picture was just a, a very helpful foundational thing for me as well. You know, I, I learned a long time ago to delegate lower priority things, but I, I realized that studying physiology, epigenetics, autonomics, and cell responses, I realized something, and I'm gonna boldly state this, that the symptoms of our body are being misled by the model of healthcare today in the world. I agree. So for, let me give an example. If you go out and you pig out and really oink out and you eat and eat and eat and you wake up the next morning with uh, a headache, oily skin, uh, nausea, vomiting, cramps, diarrhea, sniffles, and you go to a, some specialist who's a palliative treatment symptomatology treater they'll say oh you need these five drugs for these symptoms an antacid an anti-flatulent an antihistamine an anti this an anti-virus an anti this and so that model is a model that oh symptoms are bad and here's something to cover the symptoms and here's a pharmaceutical approach and there is a place for that but not as necessary as people think Agreed. Then if you go and you go to maybe a naturopath or a chiropractor or maybe somebody that's on that natural healing or whatever, and they ask you, so when did it begin, these symptoms? Oh, this morning. So what did you do last night? Oh, I ate 40 pounds of food and I've got diarrhea, cramps, bloat, everything else. I said, do you think that those symptoms are things to get rid of or symptoms to guide you to live wisely? Hmm. So when I started studying physiology, I wrote a big textbook on about a thousand different health conditions, not from a pharmaceutical approach, but from a psychological, biological approach, applied psychology and physiology to try to help people see what it's actually trying to reveal to them. And one thing I'm convinced of is your body is doing everything it can to try to get you authentic. Because when you do things foolishly that create the symptoms like overeat or undereat, those are ghrelin and leptin hormone alterations as a result of perceptions that are skewed. And those are usually skewed because you're either too proud to admit what you see in others and you're narcissistically projecting onto them and then getting angry and affecting physiology and autonomics by the sympathetic response, or you're too humble to admit it and you're looking up to somebody and sacrificing for them and, and not doing what you really want to do and then creating symptoms and then creating these symptoms are actually have a motive there. 
And the symptoms are there to try to get us back into authenticity. Our physiology, our intuition, our sociology, the people around us and their responses to us, believe it or not, are not random. If we get cocky, people criticize us, we get humble, they lift us up. They're mechanisms to get us into a state of authenticity. In fact, all the symptoms in every area of those seven areas of life are offering us feedback to guide us into the most authentic, most inspired, self-actualized state we can live. That's why everything is on the way, not in the way. If we ask the right question, the quality of our life is based on the quality of the questions we ask. But we've been skewed by a polarized, amygdala-based, um, hypocrisy, moral-based structure that we're supposed to be one-sided and life's supposed to be one-sided. And if it's not, there's a problem. Right, wrong answers instead of creative thinking that we've lost sight intuitively about this path of authenticity. And boy, when we live a truly authentic and inspired life by delegating and prioritizing, our physiology rallies and fitness automatically goes up because of it. Agreed. I absolutely love that. And, you know, I can remember like along the way, I love that things happening on the way, right? And be able to, to listen to the body, right? The body, like, even though you could say on the calendar, I've got this thing, but the body's saying something else to listen to that and to follow into that. You know, there were days where it's like, okay, I need more sleep or I need to kick it into action more. But to listen to that is like, a, I think a discipline in and of itself to just be in that, that intuitive place of, of what works for you. Because again, like you said, all things, all things are, you know, different for each person and what they need and what shows up for that. And so when we can look at all the different factors and then listen to that intuition and be able to move forward from that place, then we're being authentic. And when I was, when I was 18 years old and I was first learning how to read, believe it or not, um, I lived in a library at Wharton and there was a series of books by Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, his quest for truth, his experiments with truth, was one of the great books that I devoured. And there he documented every day what he ate, what was in his mind, what his thoughts were. He did probably the most comprehensive self-analysis of himself to try to find out what worked, what didn't work in his own life, why did he react, etc. I found that really eye-opening. And so I started that. I started doing self-analysis back when I was 18 and started to look at what I was eating. And I wrote down every single thing that I ate, everything that I drank, what time it was, and what was going on periodically, hour by hour throughout the day, and my thoughts, my feelings, and my actions, and charted that for a period of time and learned more than almost any book on nutrition about what was working and not working and what were my reactions. And then I started realizing that I had associations with different foods that was causing these reactions, associated with different behaviors that were moral constructs that I had subordinated to. I learned so much about myself and I realized that a lot of the stuff we've been taught isn't so. It's just we've been taught it and nobody's questioned it. Mm. And it started me on a journey of self-reflection, self-reliance, uh, self-accountability, and, and, that, and it's allowed me to go 48 years without any drugs, no aspirins, no pain pills, no any form of drugs of any form. So I, I, I question whether that is really the solution, looking for a magic bullet instead of like, like Jim Collins says, you know, in Good to Great, uh, it's the incremental momentum building little baby steps that make big dreams come true. Not this one big killer. Instead of looking for the magic bullet, why not just constantly refine your own behavior and and find out what's working and not what working and stick to what's priority and become masterful at something you build momentum achieving wow what happens when people give themselves permission to do that they're like a bruce lee becoming a legend in the, as far as his martial arts i love it oh it's so good well you and i could talk all day about this i, I love it so much and you know, uh, this is a great thing for people to step into, especially in a new year in 2021, to really start asking deeper questions. Like, don't just assume the way, you know, things were in the past, that that's what it is going forward and, and how you can ask yourself those deeper questions and decide to, to live into your truth. So I just want to thank you so much for, for sharing your wisdom and being here on the show. We'll put all of your contact information in the show notes, but is there anything you'd like to shout out to anyone as far as uh, how to stay in contact with you? 
the, the easiest way to uh, reach me some way is through uh, drdmartini.com, my website. And on the website is a value determination process that's complimentary, it's free, it's private, it takes about 30 minutes of your time. If they'd love to go and look deep probing into what's really important to them and not just assume, please take the time to go on drdmartini.com, the de determine your values section. Just find that. Go in there and do a little 30 minutes of self-exploration. It'll be private. Go back and do it again a week later and a month later and take a look at what's really important to you. Because if you don't decide it, look, nobody's going to get up in the morning and dedicate your life to your fulfillment. If you don't decide what that is and structure your life and master plan your life, you're going to be automatically at the whims of other people. And by definition in physics, that's called entropy. Entropy is the frustration of trying to live in other people's values instead of being truthful to yourself. So the magnificence of who you are is far greater than all those impositions that you'll ever get from the outside world onto you about how you're supposed to be. So give yourself permission to do a, and by the way, there's no rules out there. A lot of the rules that we think are rules out there are just subordination to somebody who started those rules. And why not set a new set of rules? Give yourself permission to give yourself your set of rules. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love that. So good. Uh, definitely. Well, thank you again so much for being here on the show. And uh, to our listeners out there, you know, thank you so much for being here. You know, this is how we get positive information uh, out into the world and to look at all of it, right? To see that we are all part of it. So, you know, if you haven't said subscribe to the show, please do so. Please share this, get it out there in the world and, you know, be a force for good in the world and however that is for you and what's authentically you. So until we connect again, live your spa life. Bye for now. Bye-bye.